Welcome to another edition of Wildcat Country. Eric Cohen and Shane Dale. It's a victorious week, so that's reason to be excited, but it's also a somber week in a way, so Shane and I will discuss that as well. Plus, we have a great guest in Shane's favorite college basketball broadcaster, Casey Jacobson, joining the show uh, in the second segment, plus a giveaway. Uh, of Ice Shakers, which we're going to talk about in the third segment. So a lot to, to go on, Shane. Before we get into Arizona basketball, who had a great uh, 2-0 and stretch after you and I most recently recorded, um, I, I just want to touch on Mike Leach, uh, who has played, his team's played in Arizona four times in the last, let's say, 10 years, um, including earlier this year. And now he has passed away, unfortunately, at the age of 61, uh, one of the great characters in the history of college football, and one of the most interesting people, seemingly, that has ever come across the sporting landscape. Just, Shane, a few of your thoughts on Coach Leach and what, um, how much he will be missed in the college football landscape. Yeah, like you said, Eric, he, he visited Tucson several times over the last few years, most recently with Mississippi State this past season in a, in a victory over Arizona. I looked through my uh, camera roll, and I, I remember I, I snapped some photos because I was covering the game for ABC 15 when Arizona played Washington State back in 2017. That was uh, during Cole Tate's crazy stretch. And uh, I, I saw I looked at my camera roll and came across a photo of uh, Rich Rodriguez talking to Mike Leach before the game. Two guys who were innovators of the game in different ways. Uh, and I know Rich Rod paid his respects for, uh, to coach Leach and his family on, on Twitter earlier today. Uh, I'm recording this Tuesday night, by the way. Uh, so yeah. And, and then I remember Arizona won that game. And, and one of my, my favorite Mike Leach memory, which I posted on Twitter was um, there was a quarterback controversy um, after that game, as far as who was going to start uh, Washington state's next game. And this guy uh, calls in the press conference complains that it starts late uh, and Mike Leach is like, yeah, sorry, you know, we, we, we're we up here in the north. It's a tough place. Uh, he says, like, fortunes of war or like, you know, it's just the, all the Mike Leach isms at once. And then the reporter asks, uh, uh, so uh, who's your starting quarterback going to be next week? He says, and, and Mike Leach, he says something like, um, well, my, 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 it sounds like you weren't for, I, I wasn't 40 minutes late. It sounds like you were 40 minutes late. That was the first question I answered. And I, I answered in this kind. Con- so that was the kind of character he was. I know he was very respectful to the media in general, but he'd call them out too when they were kind of being a pain in the butt. Um, but yeah. By the way, great- Shane, Shane, yeah. do you remember uh, one thing about the quarterback in that Arizona game that you're re- referencing was none other than Tyler Holinsky. That's right. Who unfortunately um, took his own life uh, several years later. Yeah. yeah or, Luke, early Luke, thereafter. Yeah, yeah. Luke Fold, I think, got, got hurt and Helensky came in and played very well. So, yeah, I, I thought about that as well. Um, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it, I was, don't take this the wrong way, uh, but I, I, I'm surprised to learn that Mike Leach is only 61. He came yeah. across as a bit older than that. He seemed he, like he was about 60 years old for a long time. He did. Yeah, it, you know, one thing about it too, Shane, is you and I were were discussing the other week about you know guests that we would like to have on maybe over the next six months. Yeah. And I actually told you, I said it'd be great if you know maybe reach out to the Mississippi State Athletic Department and have Mike Leach on in the off season. That's right. Before next week's That's before right. next year's game. Yeah, because they're playing because again this su- season. Yeah. Right. Because he would have been such an interesting guy mm-hmm. to have on. You know, we had Steve Spurrier on. Yeah. He was really one of the more interesting characters in college football history. Uh, Leach is right there with him. I, you uh, know what? I bet you Mike Leach would have done it too. I bet if we would have extended the invite, he would have come on with us. It's just, it's tragic. And I, I think what's, what's, I mean, great to see is everybody, I mean, everybody, every coach and, and everybody just saluted Mike Leach on social media. I mean, didn't, you know, obviously he wasn't for everybody. His personality was what it was, but everybody had a funny story or, you know, just uh, paying a nice tribute to him. I thought it was really, really nice yeah. to see everybody come together. But I will also say this, Shane, college football is a worse place today without Mike Leach than it was a couple days ago. No doubt about it. You know, everyone from college level to the pros um, singing Mike Leach's praises and rightfully so. One last thing I'll add is uh, there was this um, transfer from Mississippi State last week who posted something very passive aggressive about Mike Leach and by like, I want to go somewhere where like, cause Mike, I want to go somewhere else. Cause Mike Leach told me I wasn't tough enough or something like yeah. that. It's yeah. a very juvenile thing to do. And, uh, and look, I, obviously the, this guy didn't know that Mike Leach was going to pass away, but I, I hope he, he did. I he wrote he, a very nice tweet. Did he? Uh, 
He did. And he just said, my thoughts are with coach. This was the other night I saw that. Okay. He was a class act. Good. Uh, with the way he handled it. Uh, yeah. This was after it was, it was noted that he had fallen ill. Yeah. So, because, yes. Yeah. And I mean, that is, is coach Lisa's death aside. I just thought, I, I remember looking at that and think, cause it got a lot of retweets and all that. And I thought, you know what, grow up, don't, don't, don't handle you. Like if I was a head coach, I wouldn't want you to join my team because you, 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 you put that kind of crap on, on social media. But anyway, all that aside, um, yeah, everyone from Larry Fitzgerald to uh, Rich Rodriguez to Jed Fish and, and everyone across the college sports and pro sports uh, said nice things about Mike Leach. He really did change the game. And for the better, he was a, a great soundbite, you know, a yeah. lot of off, off, you know, away from football things that he would say. And, uh, you know, our thoughts are definitely with him and his family. I was at uh, five games. I've been to five games that Mike Leach coached, including the uh, guaranteed rate bowl in 2019, which was the last game he ever coached at Washington State for going to Mississippi State. But I'm glad that we had a chance to see him in Arizona Stadium in September. It was a game that I picked Arizona to win. Unfortunately, uh, we all know how that game ended Got up. Got off to a good start. Once again, Mike Leach uh, outsmarted us. Uh, <laughs> and he is one of the greats. And I, I know that the threshold of making the College Football Hall of Fame is a 60% winning percentage. Well, he is just below that. I hope they make an exception because he Me is too. the definition of a Hall of Famer for what he has done in, let's be honest, three difficult places to win as a head coach. Absolutely. Uh, and, and he's quite the innovator. So uh, condolences to his friends, family, uh, and Mississippi State and uh, all of those that he has uh, affected uh, in a positive way over the years. Okay, um, transitioning to our normal show. And we have a lot to get to this week, uh, basketball, football, and more. But first, it is by yourself, presented by our friends at Ice Shaker. And Shane, I, you know what's cool is not only are you and I holding up our Ice Shakers, but it's, you can also go to icesshaker.com and, and use promo code Wildcat Country and get uh, $5 off, capital W, capital C. But you can also go to fanatics.com yep. and you can type in Ice Shaker Arizona and order your Ice Shaker there. So very, very cool. And we're going to give away a couple of Ice Shakers Later in the program, we're going to tell you how to win one of those. So stay tuned, and uh, we will talk about that at the beginning of the third segment after Casey Jacobson joins us. But question number one in buy or sell, Shane, Arizona's win over Indiana. Considering the quality of the opponent, was their, vis was their most visually impressive of the season thus far, buy or sell? I'll buy it. I think it was the, most, uh, the best well-rounded win. I think they responded to every Indiana rally. Uh, their defense still... I mean, I, I don't want to be a wet blanket, but I, I am so often. Um, uh, Indiana was a bit shorthanded, and, and Arizona still allowed 75 points. With that said, great performance all the way around. You know, we, they answered some questions that we were concerned about, uh, their bench play. And they had a great uh, – their bench shined uh, in the, the win that, that we just saw against uh, Texas A&M Corpus Christi, even though – that was an easy win. Their bench looked good. Pella Larson is looked more like uh, we hoped he would. So, yeah, I, I think it, it was a, a more complete victory than probably anything they did in Maui. Um, but it's something that there's still room for improvement, especially on the defensive side of the ball. And, you know, Casey Jacobson, I'm not going to list them all right now, but he has his, his uh, four pieces of criteria for a Final Four team. And Arizona, in my opinion, hasn't reached all of those just yet. Um, but – very impressive win. You know, Indiana fans, I guess, whining about this goaltending call and what was supposed to be an alley oop lob that cost them the game, even though they lost by 14 points. Uh, whatever. But uh yeah, I I I'll buy that it was it was an impressive win against a very tough opponent and against the opponent that had a lot of fans there, even though the game was closer to, yeah. to, to Tucson, a lot of Indiana fans there. Yeah, and I had heard that from a friend beforehand who was in Vegas who was like, Indiana fans are everywhere. And I'm yeah. like, no, no, Arizona. He's like, you gotta trust me. Indiana fans are everywhere. They do have and a history. Uh, I, I'm i going to semi buy this one, that it was their most visually impressive win. I was really impressed with the way they played against San Diego State. Now, mm. I think Indiana is a better team than San Diego State. Yeah. But I, I this is right up there, you know, because that was the second of back-to-back -back nights in Maui. I, I, I'm going to – I mean, they looked really good, and they were in control throughout the game against Indiana. So I'm going to, I'm going to buy this, but it's not like – like a full buy because I really that San Diego State game was was another one where Arizona, with the exception of one stretch at the beginning of the second half, really was not in much jeopardy. So uh, nice to see that uh, this team certainly is turning the corner. All right, now 
The most impressive part, though, Shane, number two, of Arizona's last two wins were the bench. Uh, Adama Ball, Henry Visar, and Kylan Boswell, especially even though Cedric Henderson has chipped in as well. Just those three guys, um, most impressive part of what you've seen the last couple games. Well, yeah, well, and Kirk Carissa left the uh, Texas A&M Corpus Christi game uh, with a, uh, a non-COVID-like, non-COVID sickness. Um, so um, my hope is that he could, he, maybe he could have played if he had to, but yeah. he wasn't feeling well. And so that he decided he was able to go back to the locker room and throw up or do whatever he needed to do. And Kylan Boswell got some valuable minutes and he put up some great numbers. Uh, yeah. So, so Almost, that was, was getting tripled. If he had played the whole game, we would have been talking triple double. Territory. Andre Iguodala like stat line yeah. almost for him. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that was a positive. Obviously we hope Kerr is able to go against Tennessee because we're going to need him. Uh, but Kylan Boswell, Henry Visar with 15, he had, you know, he, he put together some decent minutes against uh, Indiana and, you know, we're starting to see why uh, AG Bramlett and Bruce Pascoe and others have, think that he could be a star. Um, because he's he's already showing glimpses of that. He's got a ways to go, but uh, to see him be a contributor off the bench, Adama Ball is is good for a couple of uh, yeah, three pointers a game. Really, yeah, and he's three big great. ones against Indiana. Kylan Boswell, like you mentioned, Cedric Henderson. So they really do seem to go nine deep now. Do they need all nine guys on on every given night? No, but it's nice to know that some of those guys are starting to come around and, and play like we expected them to. These last two games, Shane, have been crucial in my opinion, and we'll make our picks for the Tennessee game on Saturday night later in. The program but the fact that arizona is now you know having visar and boswell grow up and, and ball contributing i i think you cannot underestimate how much this means in my opinion to what the team uh has done now we'll ask casey later in the show his thoughts on depth for mm. the team but i am i'm ecstatic from what i've seen from these guys so I'm going to buy this one as well. All right. Yeah, and real real quick, Eric, I, I think with, with Visar and Boswell in particular, you know, Visar has never played in uh, college basketball in, in America before. And Boswell, he's still 17, I think. Yeah. Uh, so both of those guys have like had came in with no experience at the college basketball level. And so just from the beginning of the season to the end of it, they're going to get a lot more and they're going to be a lot more seasoned even you know, going into March than they were at the beginning uh, of the season. And so that's why I'm hopeful that the bench is going to come together along with Henderson, who's still the first guy off the bench and Adama Ball, who's already contributing some valuable minutes. Okay. Number three, Arizona got hosed Shane by only being ranked ninth and moving up one spot after beating Indiana last Saturday. Now I'll sell that one because you look at the top 10 and other than Arkansas, that was a team they passed there really wasn't a case to put them ahead of anyone else. You know, Tennessee, obviously they had a big win as, as equally as impressive a win uh, over Maryland. Uh, you had, uh, there weren't a lot of, uh, the only upset was in the, you know, the number one team losing to the number. Uh, Texas. Yeah. I mean, Texas, you could have, they could have easily jumped out. I mean, you may yeah. lost a game on the road, Shane, and Utah's eight and two and maybe nine and two after this game. Yeah. They're Utah's nine and two, but they I were, mean, un, they were unranked. And I think most people, most of the pollsters didn't think much of Utah at the time. Now, it, you know, going at this point, maybe it's a little different, but I think Arizona's ranked about, I about where they should be. Maybe even a little generous, just because you look at the, the other numbers in uh, Ken Palm and BPI and net and Sagarin, they're all in the 12 to 16 range. So I think number nine is about where they should be. Now they beat Tennessee they're going to take another jump forward. And that's yeah, what I always say. As said. If you're not happy with your ranking, just keep winning and the and you'll move up accordingly. Okay. Uh, I'm going to sell this one. I think Arizona should have moved up a couple more. Uh, I thought the, dr the drop from what, four to 10 was probably a little much uh, on the road at Utah, even though they didn't mm -hmm. play well. Uh, I mean, rankings don't mean a ton. It's all about the metrics, as you said, the Ken yeah. Palms, the the net rankings, which you are very generous to post on your, your Twitter accounts. So check that out. It's on a lot of hard work. It, it, listen, I mean, it's good. I, that's how I find out. It's not like I'm pulling up net rankings. I just look at your Twitter feed. Uh, let's transition to football for a couple of questions here. So let me just put it this way. Let, let's give a little background. So Arizona has lost some guys to the transfer portal, seemingly. And they're getting some pretty good offers. I mean, Keon Barr is getting offers. You're like, this guy, you know, on defense, uh, Arizona's defense was terrible. I mean, it, there is some concern there that they're losing all these guys. One guy that I was surprised that they lost was Dorian Singer, or supposedly are losing. I mean, you never know until it's all done. I mean, yeah. unless this is the Mejon Wright effect where comes, goes, comes, goes, you just never know. Number four, though, Shane, losing Dorian Singer would outweigh Arizona keeping 
Jacob Cowling, which by the way, I suggested to you when we didn't see him on senior day that there was a chance he might come back. Yeah. So losing Singer, who had surpassed Cowling at the end of the year as the team's leading receiver, outweighs keeping Cowling by yourself. I'll sell it because I think it's about even. I, I still think in, in terms of big plays, I, I, I feel like Cowling is, is more of a go-to guy, like a, a guy who might help like single-handedly win you a game if you need to. You know, he was uh, like number one in the country in yards after after the catch. Um, so you know, their stats were about even, but I Singer had a fantastic season. Don't get me wrong. And he's gotten so many offers, including from Oregon. I can't imagine he's going to come back because he's gotten so many. And there's I'm sure there's going to be some NIL money in there for him. Uh, but I I think they're about even, but I think I feel like Cowing is a guy who could maybe take over a game late more likely than Singer would. So uh, it's about even. So if you're asking if it's more valuable, I'll sell it just if for nothing else, I think it's a wash, just keeping Cowing and losing Singer. I'm actually going to sell this one because I think Cowing is a better player. Okay. Um, Cowing is to me the more dynamic receiver. I know that Singer had some great catches, but Jacob Cowing is a, I, I mean, I know he's, he's smaller, but that guy is a dynamic player. I know down the stretch, as I said, Singer was the better receiver, but I mean, just the fact that Arizona is going to have Cowing and T-Mac back next year, holy smokes, that is fun. I was disappointed to see that Anthony Simpson decided to uh, transfer as well. Yeah, uh, but he was he started whining on social media. And- I know, I, I know, but I aside from that, I thought he was a guy who could step up and, and, and get some significant uh, playing time. They have season. plenty of guys and we'll, and we'll, yeah. we'll pretty, I mean, Kevin I think, I, and I think they'll do, I think they'll do fine in the transfer portal at wide receiver defense. Is well, a- I mean, listen, uh, we're going to, you know, in the, in the coming weeks, we'll talk more about the transfer portal. I know Jed fish before we recorded the show tweeted a dancing cactus, which means he's got somebody, yeah. which is exciting. Now that leads me into number five, Shane and by yourself, Re- high school recruiting seemingly means very little now with the transfer portal in college football by yourself. I'll sell it. It obviously doesn't mean as much in terms of playing time right away, but I, I, and especially because guys can transfer wherever they want after a year or so, which I think needs to be tweaked, but we can talk about that another time. No, it still means a lot. And you just think about the territorial cup game, Eric, uh, Arizona doesn't win that game without a true freshman, Jacob Manu making two huge plays in the fourth quarter. Uh, so, and he was a, a guy that Arizona got uh, out of Servite along with a lot of those other guys, you know, uh, Tedero McMillan. He obviously, it was a, it was a big, now Arizona's not going to get a lot of five-star guys, right? Maybe once a decade, they'll get one, but still. So it doesn't mean as much, but if you look at Arizona's roster and the guys who will be coming back and getting significant playing time and who, guys who already have like McMillan and Manu and uh, Jonah Coleman, who scored a touchdown in, in that territorial cup game as well. Uh, it still means a lot. It still means a lot to build a class and be able to coach your guys. I think a lot of these guys are leaving, especially on defense right now because they didn't sign up to play for Johnny Nansen. Now, a lot of them didn't sign up to play for Don Brown either, but I think that Nansen's got a different style and maybe he's needed to get his guys in there. I'm certainly concerned about the number, the quality of guys who have left on defense because uh, as bad as the defense was, we're losing a lot of the top guys on, on the defensive side of the ball. But no, to go, circling back to your question, I, I'll sell that it doesn't mean much. It doesn't mean as much right away, but it's still important to build a uh, good recruiting classes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to somewhat sell this one because now you can plug holes so much easier than you ever could before. Sure. Sure. And I mean, you, you have to worry about guys getting plucked off your roster every year. Yeah. So I'm not as concerned about high school recruiting. Now I'm concerned about who can you go, especially for a school like Arizona, where you got to bring in new guys every year to kind of stay competitive. Look, like you're not playing for titles. I mean, Arizona's not playing for a national title. Like Alabama and Ohio State, yeah, you want to recruit because you're not going to lose that many guys to NIL stuff. I mean, you will to other ones, but like once they're already there and if they're playing, you're not going to lose guys to other schools generally for NIL money, at least at this point. For me, Arizona is a team, you know, whereas the JUCO route used to be the way to go where you're like, all right, well, you know, Kansas State always used to reload with JUCOs. Arizona is going to be a school every year that's going to have transfer portal things. I mean, next year, we're probably going to be talking about T-Mac, unfortunately. Like, I mean, let's hope not with if Noah is the star is the starter and Jaden leaves. But like the fact that his buddies are there, I think, is a huge deal. I do, too. But we're every year we're going to be worried about, like, is our best player going to be plucked by USC or UCLA? Yeah, I hate it. I hate that. 
I know because I I, I don't I, free agency is fine and in the pro sports I hate it in college now when it comes to basketball and free agency it's also a good thing for Arizona because Arizona is one of the schools that's going to be able to pluck people away yeah we, and I think Tommy Lloyd's going to improve with it now we've seen with Henderson and Ramey these guys are useful pieces yeah. and last year with Justin Kyer for example was a, was a useful piece. Very it will so. be interesting to see what Tommy Lloyd does with that going forward. All right, a couple of quick bonus questions uh, before we go to Casey Jacobson. Number one, Shane, bonus number one. Uh, Gus Johnson and Bill Rafter, who called the Arizona-Indiana uh, game on Saturday night, are the equivalent of a college basketball broadcasting dream team, buy or sell? I uh, absolutely love Bill Rafter. He's one of my favorite guys, he, even as, as uh, seasoned as he is now. He's great. Mm-hmm. Gus Johnson, I have... I've warmed up to a little bit because like screaming Gus Johnson drives me crazy and Ener- reasonably energetic Gus Johnson, which I think we got for the Indiana Arizona game is fine with me. So the two of them, I think are, are a great combination. Uh, I I'm, I guess I'm really old school in that. I preferred the, uh, the Vern Lundquist, Bill Raftery combination that during the NCAA tournament, when Vern Lundquist has since retired. Um, but no, it, it's it was great. The, the ratings for that game, I don't know if you saw them, yeah. were, were spectacular. So uh, people are invested in college hoops. It was a great atmosphere. I wish I was there. It, um, but you have that. You have a a you know an A A team uh, on commentary there in person, which is great. Uh, they don't always get that these days. So I like I said, I've lightened up a little bit on Gus Johnson, but Bill Raftery to me is an absolute tr- national treasure. I had a chance to meet both at McHale Center, maybe eight years ago when they did a U of A ASU game and two very, very nice guys. Yeah. And I got a chance to do a little onions for Bill Raftery. And he loved that. Well, of um, course he got to send, send it into Rome. Yeah. Well, of course. Oh, yeah. That's right. From Sean Miller. Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, Gus is the best basketball and uh, college basketball announcer, in my opinion, play by play guy, football, eh. uh, college basketball. He's great. I mean, the old vintage tournament calls where he's gets out of control. I love it. And Raftery's uh, the best color broadcast. Oh, they remember on, the Shane. UCLA Gonzaga game. Oh, it's like, the best. That's the, that's, that's, with the that's the best uh, play-by-play no. college basketball I've ever heard. Don't make it about yourself, oh, it's, okay? It's Ener- it, energy is fine. Making it about yourself and taking attention away from the game is what gets on my mind. And I love I love Raftery. He's the best. So I, that's why I love this team. I'm going to buy this one. All, All right. right. Number two, Shane. Uh, bonus question number two. The vintage 97 unis Bye. that Arizona Bye. wore on Saturday night. Yeah, I love them. Why yeah. are these not the full-time unis? Well, I actually... I, I liked the, the uniforms two iterations ago before they added the grading. I thought those were nice. I didn't think the they, had, and these are the all time best. But yeah, I yeah I like those. I actually have a couple in uh, in my closet somewhere that are too big for nice. me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I those are, those are great. The the other ones, you know, the eighty eight era. I still think they look a little too Gonzaga ish. But yeah, the the ninety seven or what. 90, how long, when do they wear those? It was like the, Nine, late nineties. Yeah. Did they wear those in the national championship year? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, so, that yes. was the one, that's what they were saying on Saturday. They were like vintage 97. Right. Right. 97 yeah. through like the early two thousands. Yeah. Those yep. are great. I, I would love to see them wear those more often. All right. Coming up next, let's talk to our buddy, Casey Jacobson, who we've only had on the show once before, but he's an outstanding, outstanding soundbite. So let's see what Casey has to say about this year's Wildcats team here on Wildcat country. Scooby, we sent you an ice shaker. Um, they are a sponsor, uh, courtesy of our buddy Chris Gronkowski. Uh, you have it Bro, right there. I love my ice shaker. Fun fact: when I was I trained with Glenn Gronkowski, everybody when we were trained together, people thought I was I was the other Gronk brother. So it's kind of funny. But yes, I love my ice shaker. It is very good. I use it every day. I am a I am a veteran to the ice shaker game, by the way. What's up, Wildcat Country? Chris Gronkowski here. Use coupon code Wildcat Country at iShaker.com. Well, Shane, we are very fortunate to have your favorite national common, uh, basketball commentator. It's true. He's your number one, your favorite of all the guys that you've talked about, uh, Casey Jacobson, former Stanford legend, NBA player for the Suns among, among the teams, and, of course, Fox Sports uh, college basketball personality. Casey, glad to have you join Shane and I. Just your thoughts on what you've seen from Arizona. I know you were doing the half, you had the halftime assignment on the game on Saturday when they played Indiana. Is Arizona better uh, than you expected them to be at the start of the season? Oh, most definitely. First of all, it's good to be with you guys. Thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk hoops. I'm as much of a nerd as you guys are. We could do this all day, (laughs) all night. Um, yeah, I mean, overall, I would say that I am surprised. I'm not going to say I'm shocked because that, that's just a little bit uh, extreme. 
But I am generally surprised that Arizona could lose. And I said this on the halftime show on Fox, that they could lose three NBA players that get drafted. And um, really, I mean, Courtney Ramey and Cedric Henderson Jr., yeah, they're nice pieces, but I didn't think that those guys would just plug in and this team would just be off and running again. I, I, I did not see that. Um, I would say that from a national perspective, there are five teams that have pleasantly surprised me this year, Purdue being the, the first. They're 10-0 and 0 as we record this right now. They're the number one team in the country. Did not see that coming. They, too, lost Jaden Ivey, a, a lottery pick. But Zach Eady, their 7-4 center, has just been off the charts good. UConn, to me, I mean, I cover the Big East with Fox and FS1. UConn was picked to finish fourth in the Big East, and I thought that was probably accurate to start the year. But Danny Hurley, Bobby Hurley's brother, has got those guys just rolling. They're, they've dominated. They've won every single game by 10 or more points. Mississippi State would be another one out of the SEC. They're undefeated. They're one of the best defenses in the country and a first-year head coach in Chris Jans. And then Arizona. So that's five. those are five teams to me that, like, I, I just, you know, as broadcasters, I think you guys know, we're often asked our opinion. We have to give predictions. Who do you think is going to – and so we give those opinions. Arizona, to me, was not – a legit preseason final four contender. They were not to me, uh, uh, you know, yes. Did I expect them to compete for a PAC 12 championship? Yes. But I thought UCLA was the heavy favorite coming into the season. So what they're doing is awesome. Uh, we should give the players first and foremost, the credit for the work that they put in the off season. And then Tommy Lloyd should get some credit and his assistant staff for, for putting in that work and getting this team ready to play. All right, Casey, I was going to save this question, but since you mentioned the final four, I'm going to jump right into it. Um, last time you went over your criteria for a final four contender, a final four team, and you had four pieces of criteria. You have uh, future uh, first round NBA draft picks, great guard play, a top 20 defense in Ken Palm and experience. And I think the only one, the only category errors that maybe lacked last year was experience. This is a different team, different situation. How do you think Arizona matches up in those four uh, categories? Yeah, I, I liked them. I like them a lot. They they check all the boxes. I mean, the first round talent one is actually a little bit tricky. Who's yeah. the best NBA prospect on this team? Um, I think it's Pella Larson. If you had to, if I had to uh, narrow one down, but I, I think it's close. I think Julius Tubelis is an NBA player. I think uh, Umar Balo could be an NBA player. Um, Courtney Ramey, probably not, but you you could convince me. Um, you know, so yeah, that, that that one is actually interesting. We were talking, uh, Mike Hill, the uh, the FS1 host of our show, he asked me that question. And I was like, you know, normally it's it's pretty easy to answer that question on a top five team. Like who who's who's the NBA player on it? This Arizona one's a little, a little more tricky. But the other ones, I think, you know, the experience last year was the one thing. I did not pick Arizona to win a national championship last year, even though they were probably my most favorite team to watch. Because I have to follow my own formula. You're not going to win a, a championship if you don't have any experience at all. That team had zero NCAA tournament experience. And I'm not saying that's the reason they lost to Houston. Houston's a really good team and probably just like the worst matchup for Arizona still this year. I think Houston would probably be the worst matchup for, for Arizona to play. Um it's just something that you you have to go through some of that 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 disappointment. You have to lose some games before you can collectively win some of those games. If that makes sense, if you go just just go back to recent history, last ten years of of NCAA tournaments, there aren't like new teams that have a bunch of new freshmen and new faces that win national championships. It just doesn't happen. Um, but this team is certainly good enough to make a Final Four, and I think you could argue that they have more experience and, and that, that experience from last year, that disappointment will only help him. It's not going to hurt him. It will only help him. Well, let me talk about uh, one of those uh, four pieces of criteria, specifically uh, that top 20 ranking in Ken Palm, because Arizona was just, they were 21 last year. So right. They're right there this year. They're in the 70 range. And I think their defense definitely needs to improve uh, uh, as we go through the season, a long way to go. But my other concern is that I feel like, and I mentioned this with our guest, AJ Bramlett last week is that, Come NCAA tournament time, having that slow plotting def pace, defensive minded pace like Houston did and does, like Virginia does, tends to be more successful come NCAA tournament time than the the pace that it, like Arizona's number one or number two in Ken Palm and tempo, and number four in offense. I feel like the, the defensive model is a little more successful come tournament time. What are your thoughts on that? 
It's, this is, uh, I love these kind of questions that they're nerdy um, <laughs> and they get into the weeds of kind of how, you know, what wins championships. And um, th there's two ways to look at it. The first is you're right. Um, and by the way, the, the top 20, uh, the Ken Palm, you, you need it. But my final formula is actually to, to make a final four, you extend it out a little bit. Top 25, top 30 defense is good enough to make a final four. To win a national championship, we haven't had uh, bad defensive teams. Right. Kansas, so, Kansas was top 20 last year. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, and they, they were like hovering right around that 20 mark, though. They yep. weren't like a dominant defense, you know. So it th there is a little bit of, of leash that you'll give a team, especially if they're really good offensively. Um, what is interesting, if you look back at the national champions of, of recent memory, they are balanced. You do not find a team that is number one in defense and 20, 20th in, in uh, excuse me, number one in offense, and number 20th in defense. That, that is usually not the case. Um, you want to have a team that can play both. Why? Because that shows a team is capable of playing in multiple or multifaceted games. Teams want to slow down in the NCAA tournament. Most teams want to grind it, uh, slow the pace. Um, and it sometimes is a little bit easier with all the TV timeouts and kind of the, you know, those big old arenas shooting can be an issue, right? You guys know, you, you'll nod your head when you play in a 60,000 foot football stadium. And now you're asking these young college basketball players to go in and play hoops there. Three point shooting becomes an issue. And so I think there's, that's another small factor that there really isn't any stat on that, but I've just known as my experience in watching tournament after tournament, the later stages, right? You, you'll you first play the first couple rounds at Salt Lake City, for example, at, at Utah's venue. But then you go to the Sweet 16, and it's a bigger venue. You go to the Final Four, man, and that thing's in Lucas Oil Stadium and 80,000 feet. And it's hard to make threes, man. It just is hard to make threes. So in those environments, is it easier to slow a game down? It absolutely is. Shooting becomes difficult. Points become premium. So, um that's where Arizona needs to, they, they need to be better defensively. And I would compare them to, do you remember at least where they are right now, guys? Remember Purdue last year? So Purdue was a top 10 offensive team all year. Uh, they didn't play at the pace that Arizona plays at right now, but they were as efficient as the, as the Wildcats were last year. They had Jaden Ivey. Um, they had Eric Williams Jr. in the backcourt. They had uh, Travion Williams and Zach Eady. They were just awesome. You couldn't guard them. But defensively, they weren't tied together. And they hovered around 80 or 90 defensive efficiency in Ken Palm all season. It was the fly in the ointment. We mentioned it many times. Their head coach, Matt Painter, knew about it, tried to solve it, but couldn't. And even though that team was ranked in the top 10, I never considered them a true national title contender mm -hmm. because they couldn't solve the defense. And what happened? They got bounced in the second round. Okay. So if Arizona wants to avoid that fate, they got to figure out a way to maybe sacrifice a little bit of the offense to make sure that you have good defensive lineups in there. You know, I, I never consider Purdue a national title contender because Matt Painter always finds a way to choke in the tournament. My brackets have gone down in flames too many times. Uh, that's just that's just one thing. All right, you, you said something really interesting. I know this is kind of off topic with Arizona, but I want to I want to discuss it. You were a great shooter uh, in your college and NBA days. What were the hardest venues for you to shoot in, and were they those big stadiums? Do you remember? And and if so, like why? I I, I as somebody who can't hit the bottom of a barrel. Like, what's the difference? A good shooter is a good shooter, right? Yeah, but this is a pretty easy question to ask. And what's interesting is if you would have asked, if I were, if this were the year 2000 and I was wearing my Stanford uniform right now, I would lie through my teeth about this, okay? You cannot ask current players and current coaches about this. They will lie, okay? But now I'm done, okay? I don't have anything more to prove as a basketball player. I can tell you flat out, Shooting in huge arenas is hard. It's harder than it is to shoot in smaller venues. And I would I would consider McHale Center, even though it's pretty big, it's a smaller venue than some of these NBA arenas that have just more airspace, which, you know, th this uh, I think the term is depth perception that people use. It yep. is real. It is not fake. It is real. The background mm. of a basket and an arena matters. It can throw you off if mm. there's too much space behind the basket it just throws you off ever so slightly and we're talking about basketball where the the difference between a shot rimming out and going in is literally an inch okay mm -hmm. um uh the other thing is when you play in venues like that the 
rims or the baskets, they come from NBA, uh, they're NBA baskets. The rims are tighter. I am telling you, the rims are tighter. They turn the screws like twice as hard. I've mm. shot at Staples Center. I've shot in, you know, my, my last career game was against um, the Kansas Jayhawks. And it was in St. Louis where the uh, um, where the St. Louis Rams used to play. Those rims were horrendously tight. You touch the rim and that thing would just shoot about 10 feet out. You wow. shoot the ball at McHale Center or Maples Pavilion in Palo Alto, California, and it's not the same. It's more hmm. forgiving. So you combine that, those two things, and it makes a difference. Shooting numbers are going to go down. So it's interesting because it reminds me of that scene in Hoosiers where you know, Gene Hackman has them measure the uh, the basket. It's 10 feet. Same thing as in this big arena as it is in our tiny gym. But you're saying there actually is a bit of a difference. Not in terms of the height of the, of the basket, obviously, but other factors. Other factors, absolutely. Depth perception and the rim tightness. Those are two things that that throw shooting okay. off. As as long as I've watched basketball, I've always wondered that question and never had an answer as good as that one. So thank you for, for providing that, Casey. All yeah. right, back to U of A. One thing that concerns me outside of, uh, you know, maybe some of the, the lack of a first-round talent and the defense, which is something, turnovers are one thing. What is the biggest concern overall that you have for, of this Arizona team? Is it maybe the lack of a bench? I mean, what what scares you the most about this team? Um, depth only comes into play when you have a season-ending injury. That's the only time that I am willing to have a legit depth talk. Because if you go, even the best teams in the country, they only have about six guys that their head coaches really trust, like really trust to win a game. It's it's very unusual if you have seven eight or nine guys that are like where there's no drop off. So I'm not really interested in having a conversation about the lack of depth or, or lack of bench for, uh, for Arizona. I think it's overrated in games and underrated in practice. Uh, depth in practice is really important. You know, iron sharpens iron. If you only have six guys and you're playing your, your first five against a crappy second five, you're not getting better that way. So I, I will say that depth matters, I guess, over the course of a season in practice. But to your overall question, what is the biggest thing that scares me? I don't have too many scary things um, about Arizona. I think they're capable. We talked about their defense. I just think they need to tighten it up um, a little bit. They don't have the the shot blocking that Christian Coloco provided last year. So I guess that's something, you know, it's not something that they can help. It's not something you can fix. Um, so, you know, you know, my parents always told me to worry about the things you can control. I don't think Arizona can control the fact that they're not an elite shot blocking team this year. So you just kind of got to move on. Um, one thing I would say, and I don't want to pick on Kirk Creesa. I really don't. Um, we can have an in-depth conversation about him if you'd like. But I, from a big perspective, I'll just say this. I absolutely am grateful for Kerr. I'm grateful for his confidence. I'm grateful for the personality he has. I'm grateful to cover a, a, a team and a player like him. Um, he's not boring, and I'm here for that. Uh, I'm in the entertainment business. He is certainly entertaining. However, on the flip side, it cannot be ignored that he is a volatile player. Um, he His superpower is his ability to pass the ball. I, I think it's an, at, at an elite level. There are very, very few players in all of college basketball that see things the way Kerr sees them. He's super unselfish, especially on the break. I think on the break, he's just brilliant. His ability to kick, throw up long passes. You guys know what I'm talking about. Those long passes that are right on the money or just the kick ahead passes. Um, he, he loves doing that. And he's a good he's a good shooter. I don't know if we can call him an elite shooter yet because he goes into these funks where he'll just shoot himself and the team out of the game. And there are numbers, and I, I'm sure you guys are aware of these, but over the last two years, Arizona has only lost a total of five games, okay? <laughs> so last year and this year, only five games. And, and by the time we're recording this, they're proud, their record is probably 42 and five. Overall. Let's hope. All right. In those five losses, Kirk Creesa is shooting 15%. That's a 1-5% wow. from three. He does not stop shooting. If he goes 0 for 5, He's very likely to go one for nine. And I've seen it before, and I'm afraid I'll see it again. And so the only thing I, as a as an Arizona fan, I'm just crossing my fingers that Kirk Creesa has one of those bad shooting nights. 
not in the NCAA tournament. Any any other time, I'm good with it. Let's go. Well, I, I, you know, Kirk Creasy is one of our leaders. Cool. But if he goes one for nine in the tournament, did you guys know that in the two tournament games he played last year, two NCAA tournament games, he was two for 17 from the three-point line. So again, it just illustrates what I'm trying to say is on a bad night, he doesn't he doesn't say, okay, it's, I, I don't have it. I'm going to do something else. He just, I'm going to keep firing. And uh, it's scary. It's scary to watch that. It's like Manny being Manny. It's just Kerr being Kerr. He is who he is, right? Uh, let, let me ask you, Casey, about the the game against Tennessee coming up on, on Saturday, a rematch from a great game in Knoxville last year. Tennessee coming off a big win over Maryland. They held Maryland to three field goals, three made field goals in the first half. Class, a, a really good test, a, a great the number one offense in Ken Palm versus the number one defense in Ken Palm at the moment. Yeah. What are some of the keys for Arizona to be successful in that game at home? Yeah, what a cool matchup, right? We don't get a lot of matchups like this for a, a clearly a clash in style. This was very similar to the matchup last year in the NCAA tournament, Arizona versus versus Houston. I hope it goes better <clears throat> this time for Arizona against Tennessee. I remember that uh, last year's game. If I remember, Tennessee completely smacked them out of the gate. I think it was like 17-2 to two or something yeah. like that. yep. And then Arizona spent the rest of the time kind of showing what they can do. They came all the way back in that game. It was really close. Um, yeah, so I, I think uh, uh, to that point, I know this is a different team, different season, but getting off to a good start um, is important against a team like Tennessee because I do think that defensively they gain a ton of confidence if early on they're they're like – playing their style, if they're dragging you down, they start to nod their head like, yep, this is exactly the type of game that we want to play. Um, interesting, the only game that, that Tennessee has lost this year, they got hammered uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, against Colorado. A Colorado team has just been all over the map this year, and it's kind of young in some, in some spots. So, you know, on any given night, Tennessee could, could be beaten. Colorado certainly showed that. I think uh, specifically, though, there's a couple of keys – I think Tennessee has two players in the backcourt specifically. Zakai Ziegler, he's one of the smallest guards in America. I mean, like Kihei Clark at Virginia is like 5'10". Zakai Ziegler is 5'9". Um, tiny, but really, really good. And he's a volume shooter. Um, doesn't shoot a great percentage, but he can get by anybody and create a shot for himself or anybody else at any given time. And then uh, Vescovi, Santiago Vescovi, who I feel like he's been there for six years, but I think he's a fifth year senior, uh, really important shooter for them who has not shot the ball well overall this season, or at least as, as good as he's capable of. Um, he's a guy that can kind of change the way that uh, that Tennessee can score on offense. If, if, if Santiago Vescovi has got it going, then I think that this uh, this Tennessee team can break seventy points. If he doesn't, they're going to have a hard, they're going to have a hard time, and they're going to need to win that game sixty to sixty six. And I just I you know I know that that Arizona scored only sixty six points at Utah, but this game is not at Utah. Uh, Tennessee is going to have to score. They're going to have to score at least to me at least seventy points. Like that's the bare minimum. And um, there are times where I wonder when I watch Tennessee, if they'll even get to 65. So um, re just really interesting to see um, if Tennessee can slow this game down in a way that Indiana could not, uh, if we're being honest. All right, my last question for you, Casey. Uh, talk about some of the other contenders in the Pac-12. Obviously, UCLA, uh, Utah, which ended Arizona, it's only lost, are neighbors to the north, ASU. They've looked sharp the last few games. Uh, give me an overview of what we can expect uh, coming up in Pac-12 play. And I know you said you're going to call the U of A ASU game uh, on New Year's Eve. So just tell us about uh, some of the other contenders in the conference. Yeah, first, got to start with UCLA. I still uh, like them a lot. They lost back-to-back -back games on neutral floor. I think they were in New York when it happened. Uh, Illinois and Baylor, who are both very good teams. That's, that's, there's no shame in losing those games. Um, they lost both those games by single digits. They, they were competitive. So I haven't changed my mind at all about UCLA. I think they will fight with Arizona for the, for the Pac-12 uh, Conference Championship. You, what's interesting about UCLA, you already know, the people who are watching this podcast, they know all about Jaime Hawkins. They know all about Tiger Campbell. What they may not know is how good Jalen Clark has been this year. He's one of the more improved players. Like, if I had to put the improved players in the Pac-12, like Umar Bala would be probably number one. Jalen Clark for UCLA would probably be my my number two. K.J. Simpson, uh, point guard from Colorado, maybe number three. Former Arizona commit. Yeah, yeah. K.J. Simpson. Um, 
But like Jalen Clark, um, I believe is the most active, versatile defender in the conference, just from a wing perspective. He can steal the ball. He can block shots. He can guard four men. Um, he's really fast. Um, his offense is, has improved. He's not like a 20 point per game score, but he, he can, he can score 20, um, this year where he probably couldn't have last year, definitely not his freshman year. So, um, it, it's interesting to see his growth. And then you still like bringing up three freshmen. Like I thought it was going to be two freshmen, but it's actually turning out to be three, um, uh, leading the charges, Mari Bailey, uh, the kid out of Sierra Canyon, really good player who isn't necessarily, I think he struggled with Mick Cronin's coaching the start of the year did not shoot the ball as well, but he's coming along really nicely, a very dynamic player and what they need an athletic wing that can create its own shot. That's exactly what UCLA needs. Um, and then they have a uh, Bona who is a rim running big, really good shot blocker, really good rebounder, a lot more athletic than, than um, uh, the late Jalen Hill or Cody Riley have been in years past. So um, really excited to see how he grows. We have the freshman of the week, Dylan Andrews, freshman of the week for the Pac-12, kind of came out of nowhere. He's a 6'2 guard, kind of skinny, but dude can play. Um, and then, yeah, let's talk about Arizona State just uh, just a little bit. Really like where they're at right now. I mean, they've, they've won, I think, eight games in a row. Um, they're one of only a handful of teams in the country that have won 10 games already. And, you know, it's head scratching. Their one loss is to Texas Southern. It was on the road. It wasn't overtime, but still, you know, um, that, that's weird. Texas Southern, I think, is only, only won one or two games all year. And one of those is to Arizona State. So go figure. I guess that's just a blip or or just randomness of college basketball, I guess. But what I like about Arizona State is um, their defense uh, is going to give them an opportunity to compete or play with any just about any team in the country. Offensively, they are a roller coaster ride offensively, Bobby Hurley, in my opinion, and I've told Bobby this, he gives him too much freedom sometimes. And you are going to uh, be successful at times, but you're also going to crash and burn in other nights because he allows his guards, you know, guys like DJ Horn and um, Nunez, the freshman kid. Um, uh, who else am I uh, missing? Frankie Collins, their new point guard. Um, Desmond Cambridge. Allows them to dribble a hundred times before they shoot, and he doesn't care. He doesn't care at all as long as they bust their butt on the defensive end. And you know, good for them. But I think against elite competition, you know, when you're playing in Arizona, you got to be tied together. You got to move the ball. You got to create open shots. You just can't take contested two point J's and, ho and hope it works out. So far, it's worked out for Arizona State. Frankie Collins, the transfer from Michigan, is a true point guard. He's a pass first guy. He can score but he wants to run the offense and it's like a breath of fresh air. It's exactly what this team needs. They got enough guys who want to jack it up. They need a point guard that's willing to sacrifice for the betterment of the team. So I really like that transfer. It might, in, in, in my opinion, it might be the most under the radar impactful transfer in the PAC 12 conference, Frankie Collins coming from Michigan to Arizona state. Well, I think you're going to be seeing two ranked teams when you call that game on December 31st, which is crazy to think because nobody would have thought that about ASU. All right, last question, Casey, and this has been phenomenal. We, Shane and I always appreciate it. I've asked this of a few people in the last few weeks, but I'm curious your opinion. If you were to do a college basketball coaches draft right now and where you would go in order of the coaches that you would want to take to start your expansion team or whatnot in college basketball, would Tommy Lloyd go in the top five? Um. No, but okay. he would be top 10. And it's really interesting you ask that because like at what point do you have to say, I need to see more? Like you've already seen enough. The, the start to this year has been like, wow. He like because you could have made the argument preseason, hey, Sean Miller left the cover like like totally loaded for Tommy Lloyd. So yes, did he do a really nice job of of unlocking the offense and the potential? Yeah, he really did. And he deserves credit for that. But he was doing all this with, with another dude's guys. And let's be honest, gentlemen, half of the job of a college basketball coach is not X's and O's, it's recruiting. <laughs> can you can you continue to sustain long-term success by bringing in play, good players that fit the way you want to play? That's half of what a, a college basketball coach is supposed to, to do. And can we say that after 1.25 years of him being a head coach that he's a top five coach in America? I just have to say, hey, man, I need a little bit more time. I, I might need a couple more years. Some of the Sean Miller recruits kind of cycle out and have a whole nother crop of guys come in before I can really say, hey, he's on the level of, you know, 
whoever you want to put at the top. You know? so that, that's all I would say about that. That is a very fair answer. And once again, Shane and I really appreciate the passion that you bring to the game, both on TV and, and coming on with us. Great to talk to you once again, and we would love to have you on before the end of the season. Sure, guys, anytime. I appreciate it. If you're looking to add value to your sports cards, you've got to check out DTSportsCards.com. They're an authorized dealer for PSA, which means you'll get great prices on your submissions if you go through them. And for just $2 a card, DT Sports Cards will take a close look at each card you submit and let you know whether it's worth grading. I just submitted some high-end hockey cards. They took a very close look, said they're good to go, and they all earned a PSA 10 grade, which tripled the value of each card. DT Sports Cards is located right here in Arizona. They provide quick, personalized service through email or direct messages. Find them online at dtsportscards.com and check them out on Instagram at dt underscore sports cards. And it is now time for our third segment, which is brought to you by DT Sports Cards. Uh, Shane, I know that you have visited them plenty, and there is a sports card show in January that uh, you'll tell us more about in the coming weeks. Yep. So uh, check out DTSportsCards.com. Great stuff, Shane, with Casey. I mean, just phenomenal. His passion for the game. No wonder he is your favorite uh, reason, you know, outside of the Bill Raffer. I mean, Casey he's, Jacobs is he's right definitely there. up there as far as far as a uh, you know, color commentary guy. Yeah. And uh, I still remember uh, he listed his that criteria, which I know I, I go to now like a Bible, which I maybe I, I shouldn't. But, uh, you know, the one thinking about the, the first round draft picks, like you said, one of the criteria pieces of criteria for going into the final four is having first round future first round NBA draft picks. I did a quick search, and for 2023, uh, there's one site that has uh, Tubelis as the number 37 overall mm, pick, but okay. nothing beyond that. But there are some guys who could eventually be first round. Vsar and Boswell could be first round guys. They, they I know that doesn't be. really count, but they yes. could be. But yeah, they, the Ken Palm, they, they've got to get better. They are uh, going into the uh, Corpus Christi game. They were number one in adjusted offense, uh, number 69. Uh, in adjusted defense, not not a nice number at all. They've got to get closer to the 30s or 40s. I think they have a chance to, to make a deep run. All right. So here is the contest that I teased at the start of the show. We have a couple of we have two ice shakers that we're going to give away to two of our uh, lucky listeners. It's a holiday season. Figure let's do a giveaway. And, and thanks to Chris Gronkowski for providing those. So here is how you can win your ice shaker. You can tweet us at Cat Country AZ with your favorite Arizona game from 2022. Could be any sport, football, basketball, softball, baseball, or more. Uh, pick it and just tweet us with your favorite game. And just say, like, favorite game, you know, football against so-and-so. If you want to give more detail, great. Uh, or you can email us at catcountryaz at gmail.com. That's catcountryaz at gmail.com. And you can do the same. Just say, hey, my favorite, here's my name, and here is my favorite uh, game. And we will choose two winners. We will announce them on the show uh, next week yep. and go from there. Now, Shane, I'm going to ask you, what was your favorite game? If I was to ask you oh. your favorite Arizona game. Now, we'll do more of this in a couple of weeks in our year-end show. But the first one that comes to mind. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to mention we're going to pick two winners at random. It doesn't. Yes. It's not going to be. Oh, this is the best answer. We're going to put them in a random generator and pick two Sorry, that yes. way. So, so yes. no, no, I just want to be clear on that. So, anything you want, you just got to send us something, and you'll be included in that contest. Uh, maybe some recency bias or some territorial cup bias, but it's got to be the ASU game. Just getting the monkey off off the back after all those years. Um, the, the, for, in terms of football, the win at UCLA was obviously. Uh, phenomenal as well. Men's basketball had some great wins. Both wins over UCLA uh, were outstanding, but I, I got to go with with that win over ASU. I think that was you know, for the first time in six years winning the Territorial Cup, um, and you know, I was squirming in my seat and out of my seat um, for four hours. You were there listening to me the whole time, and my Tourette's when they when they uh, start start uh, when Jet started. Uh, insisting on throwing the ball who, who would have thought you'd be more vulgar than me during yeah. a game well i think you're you're kind of more like more consistent i'm more like go from like zero to a hundred and back you know i get i get i go back and forth quite a bit but anyway 
uh, the, the win over ASU, it has to be that just because it's the first time in six years. And I think it's going to, in terms of fan uh, support and ticket sales next season, it, it, it was a massive win. Okay. Mine, the, the one game that I would say is my favorite game of, uh, there'd be two of them, but uh, I would say the North Dakota state game in September. Okay. Uh, I know that's one's kind of random and San Diego state was also uh, interesting just being at the game. It was so hot and uh, yeah. you know, so I'm going to, I'm going to rule out that one. I'm going to say North Dakota state. I walking out of the stadium. I, I think you tweeted about it. You're like, congratulations to, to me. It was my first home win. Oh yeah. That I had yeah. seen at Arizona stadium since 2019. Cause I obviously right. wasn't at the Cal game last year. It was just that, that relief that that finally happened. Um, that's fair. So, and it was, well, listen, North Dakota state is in the final four of the FCS. Yeah. No, it, was good, well it, was, it was a quality win, you know, it FCS was a, right. none. I mean, that's a, that is a, they're a, they're the equivalent of a, a bowl level team in, in, in FBS, in my opinion, with all the, all the fans that traveled, the ASU game was just uncomfortable throughout. Oh, it was like, for sure. No, it, it was agonizing. I agree, but it was just the payoff, you know, the, the drive home with the win. To yes. me, was was all was worth the the four hours of agony. So I'm gonna say North Dakota State just because it had been so long since I had seen a win at home. Okay. Uh, I mean, San Diego State was cool, but it was just so hot, and yeah. I didn't stay till the end of the game. So I was like, all right, I got it, you know, because I wanted to get to Del Mar Racetrack and all that. Oh yeah, uh, of pr- course. Priorities, yeah. Yep. So it was a great day. That was my favorite day uh, of the year. But okay. as far as the actual game, North Dakota State was it for me. But you Fair tell enough. us. Uh, your favorite Arizona game, basketball, football, softball. I mean, you could do softball making the the uh, World Series. You do baseball, maybe beating Miami, knocking them out of the tournament. Be soccer beating USC or you know, the big one over right. the US. Yeah, so so yeah, t- tweet us at CatCountryAZ or email us CatCountryAZ at gmail.com. All right. It is time for Prediction Shane, which is uh, brought to you by DT Sports Cards, as we mentioned. All right, we're going to do three college bowl games this week. And then we're going to pick the basketball game. All right. We have the Cure Bowl. And the only reason I'm doing this one, we have two ranked teams, Shane. We have number 24, Troy, is a one and a half point favorite against number 25, UTSA. Who you got? Where is the game being played? Uh, I believe it's in Orlando. Okay. Well, that doesn't help me. Uh, Troy against UTSA. You know what? I think UTSA has been a a fun story. I'll be honest. I don't know much about either of these teams. But I don't know. UTSA has been kind of a fun story this year, so I'll I'll go with them. Plus, I need to make ground on you, and you're you're probably going to pick Troy, aren't you? Yeah, I am. Uh, you're three games down to me after uh, losing two. Uh, uh, you know, in the final yeah, week of the season, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going with Troy. These are two. This is the Sun Belt champ against the Conference USA champ. It's really a toss up game. I just have a. I, I liked what I saw of Troy uh, when they played Coastal Carolina. They just whooped him. Do you do you uh, remember? Do you remember in 2014, Eric, when uh, Arizona won won the Pac-12 South? They struggled to to win at UTSA that year, if I remember. I right. do, I do remember yeah. that. Yeah, in the Alamo Dome, that was tricky. So it's good good memory there. Yeah. Uh, the a couple of Pac-12 games, Shane. The Jimmy Kimmel LA Bowl. No uh, Washington State is taking on the Mountain West champion Fresno State, who is a three point favorite. I, I, Fresno State's won like eight in a row. After a one and four start, I, I I think they're rolling. Washington State was miserable in their bowl game, even though it was kind of a last minute matchup against Central Michigan last year with Jaden Delora as their starting quarterback. Uh, I'm going Fresno State to win this game by a touchdown or so. How about you? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with uh, Washington State. Uh, um, Pat called Paxwell Pride or whatever. I think Washington State is is legitimately good, and um, you know Fresno State's had the hotter hand, but I. I I'll, I'll go with the Cougars. And and by oh. the way, the the by far the best thing about about the Jimmy Kimmel show is Guillermo. The rest of it, I don't care about. Okay, fair enough. Uh, and then our the last one, the bowl, the Las Vegas Bowl, one that you and I have fond memories from Arizona being in. Yep. Uh, Florida is missing a bunch of players, and they're taking on Oregon State, who is favored by 10 and a half. Who you got? Uh, that line seems a bit high. I, I, I like Oregon State to win, but I'm going to take a Billy Napier's guys to cover. I'm going to go uh, – we're, wow, we're disagreeing on all three this week. Shane, no, you're gonna, yeah. you might have a chance to tie it. Or I'm, I'm going to be six State. back. <laughs> uh, or, or you're going to be six back. Yeah. Uh, but there are a lot of bowl games that we'll pick in the coming weeks, but I actually like uh, I like Oregon State to win this game by by 14 or so. I just I think their defense is going to shut down Florida. Uh, okay. Jack Miller is going to quarterback for Florida, the Ohio State transfer, from Scottsdale, who we had talked about uh, with Arizona potentially recruiting him last that's, season. That's right. So uh, very interesting little connection there. Finally, Shane, it's time to make a prediction on the big game on Saturday night, 8.30 on ESPN or ESPN2, one of the one of the channels. 
Uh, Tennessee comes in and is in the, what top 10 against Arizona. They're a little more highly rated than, than Arizona. Uh, who are you picking and why? Permit me to back up for just a second since you mentioned ESPN. I want to mention what Dick Vitale said about Chris Beard earlier this week. The, the whole story about Chris Beard yep. and, and the domestic violence uh, assault and, and all that, I mean, allegedly. But Dick Vitale, who immediately convicted Sean Miller after the e- Mark Schleyabaugh's bogus story about DeAndre Ayton, says, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's not rush to judgment about the Chris Beard situation. Let's get all the facts. So Dick Vitale, I still have a lot of respect for what he's done for the game, but he's a flat out hypocrite in that regard. So I just okay, want to mention fair. that since you mentioned yeah, okay, that, that was a healthy reminder. I wanted to mention that on this show. Uh, as far as the game, I, I, I think this may be a situation where I think Tennessee maybe is a bit better team. I'm definitely better on, on the defensive side of the ball. But how many times, Eric, have we seen the McHale Center crowd drag Arizona past the finish line when they've made yep. it? Yep. You know, and, and I think this could be one of those games where the, it's going to be a great atmosphere. You know, I think back to as far as big non-conference games when they played Florida. It was like ten years ago now, which is crazy yep. to think about. Almost ten years ago to the day, I think. Uh, and and Arizona pulled a win out, even though they were not the better team for most of that game. I feel like this could kind of go the same way. You know, Tennessee, which. Uh, is the best defensive team in the country as of now, plays that slower, methodical pace that we've talked about, held a a very good Maryland team to three field goals in the first half. But Arizona's going to be at home. The crowd's going to be going crazy. Uh, Tennessee hasn't faced a team like Arizona this year in terms of the tempo that they play with. So I feel like this could be a game like where maybe Tennessee plays better for like 30 out of 40 minutes, but Arizona makes enough big plays late. Uh, they have a tendency just can't stop uh, Balo and, and Tubelas. Uh, and then if Arizona can get enough three point shooting, like they did against Corpus Christi, even if they're half as good against Tennessee, I think they'll find a way to win by a couple of points. All right. Uh, last week I felt fairly confident in the Indiana game and uh, they, they took care of business one by 14. Um, I just have a feeling here, Shane, one thing you did not mention was revenge last year. Oh, Arizona yeah. got whooped at the, the start of the game as, as discussed with Casey, Arizona was getting blown out, came back, I think took the lead and then just kind of, uh, gave it up towards the end. Very questionable it, officiating in that game. Yes, as well, it was, it was awful. It was awful. Yeah. And we, we ranted about it the next week on the show at home. I, I wish it wasn't an eight 30 start. Cause I would have gone to it. Uh, yeah. that this is awesome. Arizona's going to win this game. And actually, Shane, I'm picking Arizona by double digits. Really? Uh, I'm going to take – Casey said uh, that Tennessee does not score 70. I'm going to take Arizona 81, Tennessee 69. Okay. And, and to your point, uh, the stat is that Tommy Lloyd hasn't lost at Arizona when they've scored 80 points or more. They're like 20, 20-something to no. There you go. So they and get I to 80, they win. Has Arizona lost a home game with Tommy Lloyd? No, they, they have a they have a 24 home uh, winning streak, home game winning streak now. It's well, let us hope that continues. Yeah. yeah, let's hope that continues uh, this weekend. I feel good about Arizona again. I'm not trying to be a homer. I just think the revenge angle is definitely in play this week. So I want to thank Casey Jacobson for joining us. Uh, great to catch up with him. Don't forget to sign up uh, if you have a chance on Twitter or email us with your favorite game of 2022 uh, from an Arizona perspective. For Shane Dale, I'm Eric Cohen. Thanks for listening, and as always, bear down.